The luxuriant emerald green landscapes stretching before our eyes are in Lancaster County in southeastern Pennsylvania. Some of these fields have been under constant cultivation since the early 1700s, when groups of refugees from European oppression came here at the bidding of William Penn to take up their lives anew. English-speaking settlers already in the area called these new immigrants who spoke only German, the Dutch. On the farms of this idyllic setting live close to 8,000 of the highly idealistic Old Order Amish, who choose to withdraw from the world and its distractions so as to dedicate their lives to resolutely following the Bible and the plow. For the Amish farmer, only the scriptural virtues of humility, holiness, and hard work can lead to happiness. The simply furnished Amish home is as far removed from the outside world as is practical. No electric wires or gas lines connected to the world. Radios, television sets, and other of the mass media have no place in the homes. Power to pump water for the house and the barn is provided by the crude water wheel in the meadow or by the windmill. Amish families are large and work is hard. Here, literally, the biblical exhortation to earn one's bread by the sweat of the brow is willingly fulfilled. To offset the bareness and simplicity of their homes, the women employ, whenever possible, splashes of color in traditional Pennsylvania Dutch designs. In an effort to achieve relative self-sufficiency, the women make whatever they can at home. For baking bread, most women prefer indoor ovens, a Dutch oven. Preparing the large dinner which the men working in the fields will expect is a cooperative project on the part of all the women in the household. At an early age, children begin to gain familiarity with the fields and the animals they will be working with for the rest of their lives. It is not long before they master the fundamentals of farming. The Amish live rooted in religious traditions in a little world of their own making. Though they would undoubtedly like to, they are unable to build a physical wall to cloister themselves. Hence, they must be content with the building of a symbolic wall to shut themselves off from the world. This wall is made up of indifference to what the world has to offer and of rejection of the influences of the world. The use, for example, of these fine draft horses instead of a modern tractor represents part of that wall. Within their little world, whether it be in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, or Canada, conformity in matters of dress, transport, customs, housing, farming methods, and the like is total. Thus, the distinction between the plain Amish world and the gay outside world is all the more firmly established. After dinner and a short rest, the girls help the men hitch up the team before going back to housework. Women are extremely proud of their show China, but only take it down on special occasions. Even the children have their chores. As the afternoon wears on, the house takes on the aspect of orderliness. For lack of closet space, the girls' dresses are hung on wall pegs. The younger girls wear the brighter dresses. Glassware and china are collected by every unmarried girl for inclusion in her trousseau.
Histories of individual Amish families are kept in family Bibles or on embroidered plaques which are displayed on walls. The first Amish came to America from the German Palatinate in the early 1700s and settled in the Ole Snyder Valley of Pennsylvania. During the massacres of the French and Indian War, many lost their lives and were buried in small family cemeteries which remain to this day. The survivors scattered. A number came south to Lancaster County. John Schmucker was among the first. The almost eroded, moss-covered stone previously marking his grave has been replaced recently with a much more legible stone. An early map of Upper Laycock Township indicates that by 1860, families of Amish had already saturated certain areas of Lancaster County. The most common names then, as now, were Stoltzfus, Beiler, Zook, and Schmucker. Still standing not far from the Amish area is one of the first homes built by the Mennonites, the religious brothers of the Amish who suffered like persecutions in Switzerland and Germany. The builder was Christian Herr. Construction by early Amish settlers was quite substantial. The farm was intended for many generations of descendants, as were the buildings. It was very rare that an Amish farmer permitted his land to leave the family. Today, the last married child stays on the family homestead, while the previously married are set up by their parents on nearby farms. Most of the expense and labor involved in starting a young couple in a life of farming is borne by the parents and close relatives. As the Amish have remained relatively unchanged, so also have the physical aspects of the countryside around them. This beautiful stone grist mill, in continuous operation since 1760, would have crumbled to ruin without the Amish to bring in business. Bridges such as these would long ago have proved inadequate if the Amish drove large trucks to and from market instead of their wagons. Here, three generations of the same family live on the same farm and work it cooperatively. Each family lives in its own self-contained unit. Everything is in readiness for Sunday church meeting, or as the Amish call it, May. The benches are waiting to be picked up and brought to the house where May will be held. The going to meeting clothes are being aired. The service is held each fortnight in the home of another member of the congregation. The three to four hour long service is beginning. It opens with a number of slow tune hymns chosen from a hymnal called the Ausbund. The person who chooses the hymn leads the verses. He is called the Vorsanger. After the hymns, the preachers and ministers, or diener, preach long sermons. Testimonies, or Zeichnis, are then delivered by members. The service ends with a parting hymn.
After the service, the day is devoted to Freundschaftsbuch, or fellowship. Each age group clusters off by itself to discuss its common interests, while the women open the picnic baskets brought by each family, set up tables by mounting the church benches on sawhorses, and serve a tasty cold lunch. Late in the day, the get-together breaks up as the older folks leave to take care of the animals and the younger folks to take care of their courtship. This young man is only interested in one of the girls. He's giving the other a ride to a friend's house where she'll pass the rest of the afternoon discussing subjects close to the female heart. Later in the evening, the young folks hold their singing. Lined up on benches facing one another, the boys and girls sing their fast tunes and cut their normal adolescent capers. The addition is being built to the old homestead, which means that a pair of newlyweds is about to move in. Since the school is a point of major contact with the world, the Amish parent adamantly refuses to accept any other than the one-room school, which he feels keeps his children close to home and in their own element. teacher is an outsider with an understanding and respect for the Amish way of life. She teaches eight grades in one room, leaving little time for personal attention to an individual or to a grade. The children themselves make up for this by helping one another and by studying quietly. In the early grades, the children take their study seriously and seem to learn quite fast. While one grade is reciting, members of other grades busy themselves doing various things, such as drawing on the blackboard the various seasons of the year or making up their notebooks. The only interruption in the smooth routine of the morning will be the lunch hour. Oh, 
Most Amish children know only Pennsylvania. After a few months, thanks to the combined efforts of the teacher and the older children, they learn to speak and to read English. After a while, Sergio woke up from his nap because he heard a splashing noise. At the pond, he saw a small elephant splashing water with his trunk. A big event in the life of every Amish farmer is the public sale. There, it is possible to get away from farm work for the afternoon, to meet with friends and to eat hot dogs and hot chicken corn soup. Besides, it's also possible to pick up a few bargains. Those who do the buying are the men, but the women do their utmost to exert a bit of influence. the older women may bring along their quilting, and the younger men, a small ball which they use to play corner ball. Corner ball, or morsh ball as the Amish call it, is played on a mushy surface. One team forms the corners of the square and throws the ball. Another team is in the middle of the square and dodges or chooks the ball. A corner man who misses or a center man who is hit drops out of the game. The team to run out of men first loses. The day ends on a friendly note with everyone satisfied. To go to town, the Amish must leave the confines of the group. Thus, they become part of the business life of the world they shun, and the symbolic wall around their little world begins to crack. And yet it could not be otherwise in the 20th century. The Amish need the products the world supplies. They also need the money the outside world is willing to pay for their products in order to buy farms for their children. But on the other side of the coin, a trip to town can achieve a number of things. One can take the family horse to the town blacksmith to have his hoops trimmed, or to have a new set of shoes put on. Or one might take the children to the general store to get them a pair of new shoes. At the farmer's markets, the entire family sells the products of the farm or the garden 
or such homemade products as cakes, pies, and preserved meats. The moment the Amish farmer leaves his farm and his people to come into town, he seems to lose his poise and self-assurance. The city is almost like a foreign country, which he cannot understand. He is always anxious to return to the farm. Those intrepid souls who come to town by buggy face the constant threat of the speeding auto. A horse is much more difficult to control than a car. The less intrepid souls come to town by bus. At harvest time, the Amish farmers pool their animals and their labor. The thrashing party moves from farm to farm, leaving behind it a number of overbrimming granaries. Wheat is sold to the local grist mill, where it will be made into flour. The outer covering of the grain serves well as cattle feed. Tobacco is the money crop. This tobacco will be homogenized and used as cigar filler. Each stake or lath holds five to six stalks of tobacco. The stalk is impaled on a small blade placed over the end of the lath. Rich green tobacco waits outside the barn to be hung up on the rafters. Later on in the year, when the plants turn brown, the leaves will be stripped from the stalks and compressed into bales. The last crop of the year is corn. During the winter, fire ravaged this Amish barn. The immediate task of the neighbors is to tear down the unburned sections and to clear the way for a new foundation to be built by contractors. Neighbors leave early on the spring morning of the barn raising. Past the charred remains of farm equipment come the first to arrive. About 200 men from as far as 10 miles away are assembling to contribute their time and labor to building a new barn. Close to 50 women are also coming to help prepare meals and refreshments.
Each man goes to the job he knows and enjoys best. A crew, including a few non-Amish neighbors, busies itself mortising and otherwise preparing the large 8x8 eight eight beams that will make up the frame. The cost of building the barn has been sustained by the entire Amish community. Each family contributes to a common fund in proportion to its ability to pay. This is a rudimentary form of mutual insurance. Conflicts between the Amish and the outside world arise inevitably. While the Amish farmer tills the land of his homestead and insists on sending his small one-room school, large consolidated schools are built a stone's throw away. How long can the one-room school survive? With highways and byways becoming more and more crowded, can the struggle between the horse and the buggy and motorized transport end other than disastrously for the Amish? funeral procession moves slowly. Drivers in powerful cars feel their momentum checked and move to pass. It's not disrespect for the hearse, just 
impatience with slowness. As the momentum of forward-moving America increases, pressure on the slow-moving Amish grows. As the American personality moves towards homogenization, Amish nonconformity is increasingly resented. The only salvation for the Amish farmer is to remain blissfully unmindful of the attitudes of the world. His back must stay turned on the world as he inexorably follows Bible and his plow toward the renewal of life in his fields each spring. 